Hi everyone, it's Quickie Baby, and welcome back to World of Tanks, and also welcome back to the Masterclass series, where I present a method, at least for me, that has worked to be able to take my tank to the next level. Now, if you're looking for an introduction to the FV217, also more commonly known as the Badger, then I thoroughly recommend you go and check out my tank review instead. Today's video is not going to be for the beginner, it is going to be for the expert. So when you think about the Badger, what do you think about? Well, the highest damage per minute in the game. You can use that to simply destroy multiple vehicles in very short succession. The issue with the Badger, however, is trying to configure it to be able to enable you to use that DPM and also to find this amazing balance between aggression or playing more conservatively to really pull out all of the tank's strengths. In the last 30 days, the Badger has the fifth highest win ratio of any tier 10 tank destroyer, with the ones that are better also very heavily armored in the form of the Jagdpanzer E100, T123, and Object 268 version 4. I would have personally thought that the Badger would have been doing more damage per game, but actually it's in the bottom five, even though it has the highest DPM. However, as its win ratio is substantially higher than the amount of damage that it's doing per game, that clearly suggests that the vehicle's armor is still allowing it to be very influential compared to all of its bottom damage dealing competitors. When I'm setting up a vehicle, I always think about do I want to mitigate its weaknesses or amplify its strengths? In the Badger's case, considering it's got the highest damage per minute, of course I want to try and amplify that main strength. Accordingly, I want to use a gun rammer, I want to use vents on this vehicle, and personally for me, I also want to use a turbocharger to try and enable me to get into position quicker to deliver that firepower. With a Bond Turbo on this tank, its top speed limit goes from 30 kilometers an hour with a field mod up to 36, which is simply outrageous. Unfortunately, if you don't have a Bond Turbo available, your top speed limit on this tank is going to be 34 kilometers an hour, which actually makes the Badger probably one of the best contenders for using a Bond Turbo on, because all tank destroyers can't get access to mobility slots. I thoroughly think that it was the turbo incorporation on this tank which allowed me to start winning two-thirds of my games solo in this tank destroyer, as well as pump up my damage, at least recently, to a healthy carry potential point. However, if you want to not use a turbo on this vehicle, then you might want to consider using a durability module, which can fit inside the survivability slot which you can take with your sixth field mod. This increases the Badger's hit points to a very meaty 2310, and more importantly, pretty much makes this thing untrackable unless it's taking multiple hits. And while the vehicle does have a fairly wide gun arc, if you set up the Badger in this way, you can get your suspension repair speed below four seconds, which is just outrageous. As the Badger has a six-person crew, you really don't have too much pressure with regards to crew skills. Just make sure you're taking repairs on all of your crew members. The last thing that you want to do is to be locked in place. Then take recon on your commander, situational awareness on your radio operator. I personally really enjoy taking designated targets on my gunner. However, I think this tank could probably do better with Deadeye. And on your driver, you want to take things like off-road driving, but very importantly, clutch braking to be able to improve the traverse speed. When it comes to field mods on the Badger, I feel like a lot of them are up for debate apart from the, the first one. You must take reinforced suspension. This will improve your suspension durability and it will massively improve your ground resistances by 15%. This is absolutely outrageous and it actually means that you have better traverse speed than if you take the other option. Honestly, if you aren't improving your ground resistances on all of your vehicles, you are making a huge mistake. It massively impacts your mobility. I'm also going to be boosting up the accuracy of this vehicle. Although you could argue that you might want to take the aim time on this tank, but both are already awesome as it is. This is probably one of the few 50-50 situations for me on the vehicle. I'm definitely going to be pumping up the view range of this vehicle. There's no point of maintaining concealment after firing. This vehicle is definitely spotted when it's firing as it's usually played in close quarters combat. Now this is an interesting one. Ammo rack reconfiguration. Do you want to sacrifice hit points and do you want to make your crew more vulnerable to being incapacitated to be able to gain 3% rate of fire? 
I personally do. Why wouldn't I want to take the best damage per minute in the game and amplify it even more? To be able to counter this out, if you want to take your badger seriously and you don't mind spending credits, you could use a premium med kit that kind of mitigates the difference. And with the ammo rack reconfiguration with my build on this tank, including a gun rammer directive, then my damage per minute gets up to 4,780. I believe if I was to use a bond vent on this tank instead of a bounty vent, then it can go up to 4,800, which is the maximum possible damage per minute in the entirety of World of Tanks. And it's just absolutely mind-bogglingly outrageous, as I'm going to be showing you in a second in the gameplay. With regards to the final field mod, I personally prefer to take repairable tracks on this tank. I know, I'm sacrificing a little bit of re reverse speed, but with the bond turbo that I have on this vehicle, I can still go backwards at 14. If you can't get a bond turbo on this tank, then maybe you might not want to take this field mod, but the fact that I'm repairing my suspension in sub 4 seconds, while also gaining 2% engine power, is just absolutely phenomenal for both my ability to keep moving and also my ability to plow up slope. And finally, with regards to the 6th field mod, I would personally recommend to take survivability and take the enhanced durability module on your second loadout for when you're playing on those close quarters combat maps. So firstly, we're going to be loading into Empire's Border. This is a map that's great for frontal engagements, but it's also a very long and large map with corridors that you're going to have to pace it down. This is really where there is no substitute for the Badger having a turbo. The turbo will revolutionize your ability to be able to get involved in maps like this. If you aren't taking a turbo on one of your builds, I just think you're putting yourself at a tremendous disadvantage, both with regards to trying to get into the combat quickly, but also with being able to try to achieve whatever your goals are. If that's winning the battle, sure, if it's trying to pick up an ace tanker, fine. But if you're trying to go for your third mark of excellence on the Badger and trying to get as much damage as you possibly can in, with the current meta of the game just getting faster and faster and faster, the Badger has to be able to get into the combat while it is still relevant. So in this situation, I was considering making my way up there, or maybe instead I'm just looking and trying to fish for a shot. Of course, I'm not going to go up that slope. If I was to go up that slope, it'd be possibly one of the most stupid things that I can do in World of Tanks. I'd end up trying to make my way up here and try and engage the CS-63, and then all it takes is a couple of tanks here to be able to engage me in the side. And once you get track to the Badger irrelevant of how quickly I can manage to repair my track, it's definitely not going to work out anyway. However, the Badger in this scenario, with its 10 degrees of gun depression, is just going to be outrageous. Look at how we're still able to plow up slope with the enhanced engine power from the, I think, the 8th field mod on this tank and also with the turbocharger. In this kind of a situation, I can't pen the Chieftain and the Chieftain can't pen me. But what I can do is hopefully be able to ricochet a shell or maybe the 60 TP is going to absorb one for me. And I can turn, snipe at the IS-4 and then turn my tank elsewhere. Now keep in mind, this is with me taking the field mod that enhances my accuracy and makes my aim time 5% worse. You could alternatively take the one that makes your accuracy a little bit worse if you want to play close quarters combat where I think the Badger is undoubtedly the best. And then my, your aim time would be 10% better than you see in this replay. And I think that for a lot of players, that might work out better than taking the accuracy. The Badger is accurate enough as it is. And I've never really found that this tank is all about sniping. This tank is more about just absolutely plowing. And that's what we're going to see here. This is where the Super Conqueror is going to. We're going to track him and lock him in place. Unfortunately, the 60 TP obviously doesn't like the fact that I, I'm playing the game and wants to try and push me around the corner. I'm not going to let that bother me. I still manage to carve up the whole of the Super Conqueror, but the 60 TP wants to push me again. I'm going to use my repair cap this time, reverse up a little bit to get a shot into the lower plate of the Super Conqueror and turn my attention towards the M60. Actually, I'm going to go hold down. Much better play. And now I can shoot the M60 while hiding my lower plate. Obviously, that's something that you all should know to do inside your Badger, and that's really not what I'm here to tell you to do today, to hide the weak points on this vehicle. What I'm trying to do is to really hammer home the importance of how you can set up the Badger to be effective in the majority of games that you will get into, and how, if, if I can do it, then you can do it. You can manage to win two-thirds of your games solo by playing the Badger, and I have no idea why this vehicle doesn't have the best win ratio of a tier 10 tank destroyer. 
arguably outside of the Object 268 version 4. So in this scenario, we've had an okay game, right? 3,000 damage, 1,700 assistance. It's nothing truly special at this stage. And this is once again where the turbo is just so important. If I wasn't using a turbo, if I wasn't managing to get forwards as quickly as possible, then I wouldn't be able to catch all of the goodies at the end of the game, right? I know there's a CS63 there. Luckily for me, he's not going to be able to keep me tracked for very long. And I'm just going to keep on plodding forwards towards the Polish medium tank. The turbo is going to allow us... Well, look at it like this. Look what we've got combined so far. We've got 4,800 combined. It's not a bad game with any regards. Um, however, let's see what we actually managed to pump that 4,800 up to by the end of this battle. And you consider whether the 12% um, top speed increase that we have from using a turbocharger on this tank will have mattered. Will it, will it have really mattered in this game? And I'm going to argue that yes, it definitely would have mattered. My badge are currently capping out at about 34 kilometers an hour, now 35. I'm not sure if I was using the Bond Turbo on this tank at this stage or if I was using a regular turbo. I think this is with the Bond Turbo, to be honest. It's just um, when we're turning, when we're zigzagging, still, you know, you can't really expect the Badger to be constantly going at 36 kilometers an hour. We've now finally got into a position where we're going to be able to engage the Kranvang, and just like this, this is where the Badger is magical. 4,780 DPM. Just firing in multiple shots. It's almost as if you've kind of got an autoloader with 480 damage. Just to, just to put into perspective how wild this thing is, that it pretty much gets its rate of fire to just over 5. I'm so hungry to get up that slope, I decide to shoot the building to keep myself going in a straight line. Just to put into perspective how wild this thing's rate of fire is, its reload is just over 5 seconds, I believe, if you have it set up in this, or maybe like 5.5 seconds, something around that. It's, it's outrageous. If you think about the Kranvar, right, it's doing 40 less alpha damage than the 480 that the Badger has. But it has to reload, and then it has a 2.75 second intraclip reload. And we don't have that intraclip re- well, we don't have an intraclip reload, and we don't have to spend the 20 seconds reloading afterwards. What you saw there is where the Badger's gun is wonderful with regards to its caliber. Its caliber is 123, 123 millimeters. That means that you can overmatch all 40 millimeter plates. So if you want to be taking your Badger gameplay to the next level, I would thoroughly recommend learning what tanks have 40 millimeters of side armor and trying to take advantage of that. And what we managed to do here is we turned the, I believe it was 4,700 uh, combined into actually 7,000 combined at the end of the game. Now, I think I probably would have been able to shoot the Kranvang. Would I have been able to plow up the slope as quickly as I was able to in this scenario? I don't think so. I think this was the engine power enhancement of the Badger from that 8th field mod with using a turbocharger as well and then hopefully some good crew skills. We were able to actually plow up slope faster than a super conquer in that scenario which put us in pole position to be able to hoover up the remnants of the enemy team. And this is really where if you're trying to pump up your damage in the Badger you have to try and focus the tank. You're going to win 50% of your games if you are completely average in a vehicle like this. But once you start to break through those flanks with hopefully a correctly set up badger and also making some good plays yourself, then it's about hoovering up as much as you can, thinking about should you be going for the tracks or should you be going for the spotting as well. And I think most of the time in the badger, it's tracks. We can still do some good spotting as well. So round two for the Badger, and you can see that I am choosing to use the durability module on the vehicle this time. This will mean that my tank is limited to 30 kilometers an hour, but it also means that we have that juicy amount of hit points, 2,270 HP, and more importantly, it means that our tracks are going to be very hard for our opponents to be able to take off. It also means that once we repair the tracks, that they're going to um, be at full health again instead of yellow health without the need for a repair kit. And it also means that we're going to repair them exceptionally quickly as well. As I mentioned, if you manage to get all of the field mods on this vehicle and you set it up in this way, your repair speed on your tracks will be sub 4 seconds. That means that not even an Object 140 with bond equipment, uh, with a bond ram, a bond vents, and with really good crew skills and a premium consumable will be able to keep you tracked. It's impossible. You will be able to repair in between the reload, even the intraclip reload of something like a Char Future 4. And that makes the Badger 
just so darn ridiculous. And the reason why I'm setting the vehicle up like that on this map is because I feel that this map turns into a crunch engagement earlier, and it's not so important for me to have the turbo to be able to waltz into position. And I feel like the majority of the time, that a map like this will be decided in close quarters combat. That's something that you're all just going to have to learn through experience in your badger and having like a vibe and a feel for it. You'll have some maps where you decide that it's better to use the turbo, and then you'll have some maps where you decide that it's better to be able to use the enhanced durability. And as you can see here, this is just where the badger is, the daddy, sitting on a ridgeline with 10 degrees of gun depression and just trouncing through your opponents, 480 damage at time. It looks like the VZ-55 alongside me, I'm not sure if they're using the autoloader or the single shot gun there. They took quite a long time to be able to fire their two shots, but considering they're avoiding the combat now, I'm not sure. I know you can tell from the flare on the barrel, it's got a muzzle at the end, does that mean it's a single shot gun? Whatever, let's focus on the badger and not the VZ-55. So the VZ-55 says he's going to help me. I shoot the IS-7, but I couldn't manage to track the IS-7 in a single shot. But oh boy, Super Conqueror, you aren't keeping those hit points for very long, buddy. We bounce the 257. We're going to hopefully be able to put one round through the top of the Super Conqueror. We shut them down, and I, uh, I tell the VZ-55 thanks. Look at this, i got a buddy here. We're fighting it against four, five. Well, we've killed one tank. We've got four tanks left. We do have a nice gun line behind us. And this is where the Badger's just the absolute boss. It's so fantastic for these kind of close quarters combat fights and these ridge lines. Uh, I, the VZ-55 asks for my help, but I tell him I'm going to fight for this high ground. Because I have to try and get spotting here. I have to try and have an idea of where the enemy tanks are. And I can hopefully use this 10 degrees of gun depression to maybe even be able to hide the uh, Centurion 7-1. Okay, so the VZ-55 comes and joins me up here. I'm worried that he's going to get shot by the T-30 as he goes around the corner. And there is the T-30. But I'm actually spotting the T-30 for the VZ-55, even though he's the one that got shot at. The IS-7 comes and makes a cheeky play against me, and I am having none of that. In fact, I got another 1,000 spotting there. Uh, looks like the Fosh eviscerating the IS-7. And I managed to track the Gorilla at the back of the map for 451 damage. I'm trying to get the second shot in. Doesn't quite work out. The VZ-55 now calls for help, and I'm wondering what is he doing. And oh my god, look at this player. He is going in. The VZ-55 rushes in, charges the Centurion 7-1. Of course, I'm just flustered right now. I'm like, okay, let's do this. My tracks absorb a high explosive anti-tank round from the Gorilla. I bounce around a premium round from the Object 263. I try to track the CS-59 to stop him from being able to get the VZ-55, but I don't quite manage to do it. I think, what shall I go for right now? The CS-63 or the CS-59, sorry, that's trying to flank me, or shall I go for the, uh, the Object 263 at the back? I shoot the Object 263, penetrating their vehicle, and my team come in to mop up the remaining tanks. And 3,600 damage blocked. 4,300 damage and 2,200 assistance. What more is there to say about the Badger? Setting the Badger up for maximum DPM, getting it on a ridgeline, and then making your decision using the uh, equipment loadouts that are available to you for either having a turbo to chase the damage or having the enhanced track durability to not being flanked makes this thing absolutely sickening. And the fact that we're still spotting for the players who are behind us. We're going to go in now against the Gorilla. Hopefully catch some T-30. And this is cleanup. And I will admit, this is where I'm a little bit sad with the Badger. When I have it set up like this. And I'm not using the turbocharger on this vehicle. I'm a lot slower. And you could argue that maybe I would have been able to get away from the T-30. So unfortunately for me, uh, this IS-7 or SDV-1 didn't really do anything wrong by driving out in front of me. It's just one of those things. But annoyingly for me now, I'm not getting anything at the end of the game. A paltry amount of spotting against the Gorilla. There's the Object 268. Going to fire one on the move. Keep driving towards them. Am I going to be able to bounce this shell? Oh well, I've managed to close the distance to a point where I don't really care at this stage. And with your enhanced DPM, you can just rip apart any tank after it's fired with that kind of a reload. But oh dear, looks like I choked the shot at the end of the game. Nevertheless, 6 1,200 damage and 2,500 assistance. Yeah, that's 8,700 combined in five and a half minutes. That is what the Badger is capable of. And if you want to be competing with the best Badger players out there, or alternatively, maybe you just want to play the Badger to its optimum capacity, that is what you're going to have to be gunning for. And with the new equipment setups, you've got more chance than ever to be able to achieve that. And it's one of the 
important reasons why I wanted to feature this specific replay as well to show you how important it is to make that decision. Should you take a turbo? Should you take a durability? Look at the map. Look at the enemy team. Make your decision, and I'm really happy that I chose the durability for this one. So now we're playing on airfield, and there's a couple of things that I want to highlight. Firstly, we're using the turbo on this map because I feel it's a, a larger one, and I have to try and get into a position quicker. The, the track durability could work out, but I feel like chasing and closing the distances on this map is more important. You do get caught out in the open a little bit. Secondly, when you get yourself into a matchup like this, where you're against your tier 9 and tier 10 tanks, sometimes it's not enough if you want to be pushing your damage and pushing your assistance and tracking inside the badger to just chill out. So in this scenario, the last thing that I want is to be able to get caught towards the north, but I'm basically waiting, I'm salivating at the prospect of getting the badger's teeth into the enemy team. This vehicle's outrageous damage potential is sometimes your biggest enemy. What do you mean, Quacky Babs? Well, what I mean is that because the vehicle is capable of so much, sometimes you can push the tempo a little bit too much. However, is this going to be the case? I'm not going to spoil it. But when I see an opportunity to be able to push with a Rhinoceronte, I'm going to take it. Hopefully we're going to be able to clap one into the SW1. Unfortunately, not quite able to. The more that I look, think about this, the more that I realize that it is a 50-50 about whether you would want to take the accuracy or the aim time on this tank. If it was like a 3% accuracy for 3% uh, aim time, I'd probably still take the accuracy. But considering it's 5% aim time on a vehicle like this, it does have really good base accuracy though, of, uh, aim time, sorry, of 1.7. It is still a toss-up. And considering that I'm mostly fighting in close quarters combat, it's definitely a decision that I, I think play around with it and see what you feel as well. But if I had... If you want to know what I've personally been using to be able to achieve the results that you see in the replay today, or replays today, it has still been the accuracy. Okay, so in this situation, this is where the badger just goes, Okay, bro, we can do this. We've managed to get rid of the STB1's tracks, and right now, knowing that the Rhinoceronte doesn't have very many rounds left, and that they're reloading and they even bounce around there, I'm just going to rip apart the STB1. STB1, highest DPM medium, or one of the highest DPM mediums along with the K91 but it doesn't have Badger DPM. This vehicle takes it to a whole nother level. It's pretty much packing about 15% more DPM than something like an SDB-1 when you set it up with all of the field mods. And poor Rinoceronte, we're just gonna lock down his tracks. And just like that, I mean, what do they do? I have no idea how this vehicle doesn't have a better win ratio. I, I just think that maybe people are setting it up incorrectly, or I think that maybe people aren't playing it correctly. All you have to do is find a ridgeline like that, Take the right field mods, and you can clap multiple tanks. Of course, without the Rhinoceronte on my team, um, I wouldn't have been able to handle that situation. Luckily, they were a good distraction plan. Um, you're going to have to try and look for when allies want to push and try to assist them in a tank like this. Oh dear. Um, yeah, my arch nemesis, Jagdpanzer E100 in a ridiculously unobvious bush. I don't think I've ever seen a Jagdpanzer E100 in that position. And probably with a Kamenet as well. Or, or maybe not. It's, it's hard to say. What I'm going to do in this situation is I'm actually going to try and lock down the Jagdpanzer E100's track twice. But now that I can't... Well, I could lock down their track, but I'm just going to go for the damage in that scenario. And now we have a stalemate. I got 328 hit points left. My team are nailing the Jagdpanzer. I know they're going to be able to deal with them. And in this kind of a situation, if you're trying to push for your marks of excellence, it's very important to have tabs on what you've done so far. I've done 300 spotting, but 588 tracking. And remember, with marks of excellence, they only count either or. It's your most tracking or your most spotting, or whichever one's higher, that gets added onto the damage throughout the battle. And with that little bit of extra spotting on the Jaegeru, I'm kind of like in a 50-50 scenario now. But with lighting up the Progetto, now clearly spotting is higher. I've done about a thousand spotting so far and about 588 tracking. Um, so now it's turned into like a spotting game. Unless I can try and get a track on a big vehicle. It, it's something weird. This is something I've never really done before in World of Tanks until about a month or so uh, ago. Um, where I tried to get a bunch of three marks in, in a bunch of my tier 10 tanks, right? You do have to have like a, an idea in your head of what you're on and what you're trying to go for and it does switch backwards and forwards depending on what situation develops. But clearly this is now a, a spotting game, right? As we have about 1,500 spotting after that, 642 on the Lorraine. 
So in this situation, I'm wondering if the Yank Tiger's in the bush, I'm wondering if the ISU-152K or even the T-103 is in that bush, and by going into the third person, I can see if my shell hits something. I ask for some assistance on the Lorraine, luckily I get it, and I'm going to try and make these six hit points do as much as they can. Should we see what we get for our six hit points, boys and girls? Mm, yeah, possibly. We're on 3,600 damage and 2,200 combined assistance so far. Let's see what we can pump that up to by the end of this battle. Oh dear, Mr. KV-4. This is one of the most disgusting things in World of Tanks, really. Um, unfortunately for me, my shell misses. At least I've locked him in place and he can't move around anymore. And you know what? If you hit me, you hit me, KV-4. If you high roll, you high roll. If you fire HE, you fire HE. In this kind of a situation, the Badger, you just have to grit your teeth, close your eyes, and keep firing. And more often than not, if you grit your teeth, close your eyes, and keep firing, the Badger's going to come out on top. At least in a one versus one situation. Just like that, a thousand damage dealt to the KV-4 with a little bit more assistance to the ISU-152K. And let the chips fall where they may, my team has won. Let's just try and get as much as we can. We bounce the Yank, Tiger's shell, we get a little bit more assistance on the RT and we finish off the T-103 with a decent roll. Pumping up our damage to 5,600 and 2,700 assistance in a sub-7 minute game. Hopefully this is giving all of you watching this video an idea of what you are competing with when the Badger gets going. You have to try and maximize this vehicle's damage potential. And also, it's either its ability to keep moving by enhancing its track's durability, or just its raw top speed with a turbo, depending on the map that you're on, to be able to compete with other players who will be pushing the Badger higher and higher. So an Ace Tanker and 7,000 combined on Empire's Border, an Ace Tanker 3 Battle Hero medals, and 8,700 combined on steps, and then an ace tanker and about 8,500 combined on airfield. And while I'm not going to be showing you the replay for the third mark of excellence uh, in this episode of Masterclass, it happened later on that day in a far more innocent game on Glacier, where we ended up with just over 5,000 combined, but five kills. Each of these games occurred during the same 24-hour period where I really hit my stride with the Badger. The things that made me the most difference on this tank was really unlocking all of the field mods and having two sets of equipment. The durability for the tracks when you have only close quarters combat, games where they are decided there and then, and the turbo for those larger maps where you have to try and maybe push through some of the danger areas, or maybe you just need to rush into the initial position to start to dominate the tanks that are still approaching it. All in all, while the Badger doesn't have the best win ratio in the last 30 days, it's by no means bad. I expect there's probably quite a lot of you out there that are very surprised that the Jagdpanzer E100, a bit of a meme of a tank, is so high up this list. How successful you are inside the Badger comes down to your ability to be able to assess the situation and to keep your firepower uptime as high as possible against whatever the biggest threat is that is in front of you. Sometimes you have to take hits to make hits, and the Badger is no exception. And when you have the highest damage per minute in the game with crazy scaling with equipment and also with the field mods as I've highlighted, that makes the most dangerous tank in a close quarters combat situation even more dangerous. And when you combine that with the new equipment 2.0 allowing a relatively slow tank to start to become rather nippy indeed, and also equipment 2.0 taking away the main weakness of the Badger which was always getting tracked and then its opponents getting its very weak side armor, then suddenly the Badger is looking like one of the more competitive tier 10 tank destroyers, at least in my opinion, and for my playstyle. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, that was it for today. Really hope you enjoyed this episode of Masterclass. If you did, give the video a thumbs up. If you hated it, give it a thumbs down. And let me know in the comments if you have any opinions about what I presented with the different field mods and equipment selection on this tank. Are there any changes you would like to make? Or have you got any other ideas that perhaps you think would help with this vehicle? And as always, thank you so much for watching. You've been Epic and hopefully I'll see you soon.